What a beautiful thought that is. To lean upon the everlasting arms of our Savior, especially through troubling times. And this can even be the thought as we uh, look through some of the statements here of Paul as we continue our study in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and the things that he mentions here uh, for the purpose of uh, not allowing the ministry to be blamed. Now, in our last study, we looked at uh, the first two verses of 1 Corinthians 6 where Paul says, We then as workers together with him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation I have secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And we looked at a lot of the underlying context of what Paul is teaching here in this portion of Scripture where he is dealing with the transition of the covenants. And so, as he says there, uh, now is the accepted time, behold, now is the day of salvation. And so then, beginning in verse 3, he says, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. So, this was Paul's mindset, and everything that he did was for the glory of God, for the, uh, for the propagation of the gospel to carry the gospel abroad as much as humanly possible. And, and he would even say, uh, as we, I think we pointed out in the last study, no less than six times, Paul states that the gospel had been carried to all the world, to the ends of the earth, to every creature, to the, to the utmost part of uh, the earth, and so forth. And so this was... Um, his mission in carrying the gospel as he was chosen to carry the gospel to the Gentiles. But even in that, every, everywhere he would go, he would go to the Jews first. He would go, if, if the city had a synagogue, he would go there first. And he would preach the gospel to the Jews first. And most of the time, uh, they as a whole, the majority that is, would reject him while some would believe. And uh, even at one point uh, there in the book of Acts, he told them, seeing that you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So even in that, he would still preach the gospel to the Jews first, but his primary mission was to the Gentiles. And so, as I said, he, d he did everything with the efforts and with the mindset that the gospel would be carried to everybody and that the ministry would not be hindered, that it would not be blamed. It says giving no offense in anything. And so he says then uh, also in, chap in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? And I actually want to look at that text we back up just a little bit in that in that text in First Corinthians chapter nine. He said uh, in verse seven, "Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses." Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for the oxen? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written. So Paul here points out that that was written, and even though that was a common practice, you just you don't muzzle the, the mouth of the ox that treads the corn. It needs a bite of food now and then. You just don't do that. But the purpose that was written in the law of Moses Paul says, was for our sakes. He says that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be a partaker of his hope. If we have, now notice what he says here, this is the point of what he's saying. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, 
is, is, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? And if others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. And so he teaches here that, uh, you know, the old saying, you know, paying the preacher, uh, that is ordained of God, that the church would support the preacher because he is providing spiritual things. And uh, Paul said that he, he had every right to be supported of them, but he chose not to do that. And in other places, he, he told why in this particular instance uh, with this congregation here, because there would be some who would, who would say that he, uh, he just is preaching for money. You know, and uh, there's, no, there's nothing in it for Paul except what he can get out of it monetarily. So uh, he would receive help from other congregations while he was there, and he didn't take anything from them. So that's the reason that he said that. He says, we've not used this power. And again, uh, he, he did that so that the ministry would not be blamed. And again, he says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. Now that doesn't, he's not saying that he could commit robbery and, and so forth. It's all things that are lawful, that's permitted uh, under the guidelines of the gospel and of the law of Moses. Those things are lawful, but even, even at that, not all things are expedient. Uh, and that's why I say everything he did, his entire mindset was for the furtherance of the gospel and that the ministry would not be hindered. He says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. And so, again, this is Paul's mindset. Uh, if he had to go without a meal, if he had to go somewhere and didn't have, um, you know, adequate clothing or things of this nature, he would do that to get the gospel out there to the people. Uh, and he would, and that's, again, this, this entire text that we're going to look at, uh, that's what he is saying. That's why he is saying this. Uh, again, in that same text in 1 Corinthians 10, a little bit later there, verses 32 and 33, he says, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. And again, in another place, Paul said that he profited in the Jews' religion before he became a Christian now. He profited in the Jews' religion above many of his equals. But he gave that up. He left all that behind. And now, everything he done was from the mindset of not seeking his own profit. He wanted to see the gospel carried to others so that they could be spiritually rich, which again, we'll see that as we go on in the text. And he says here, uh, but in all things, so he says, giving none offense, give no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God. And uh, this is perhaps not the best translation here, uh, the word approving. Um, it is better translated as commending. And we can see the same sentiment by Paul uh, back in chapter 4, where he said, But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So again, the things that he's going to mention here and these contrasts that he's going to make, um, he is stating this not to boast, but he is stating this to commend himself and those with him as being the ministers of God. Um, you know, why, why would any man put himself in such uncomfortable conditions and suffer such things for any other reason other than the love of God and to further the gospel. So give no, give no offense, 
and anything that the minister be not blamed, but in all things, he says, approving or commending ourselves as the ministers of God. And he said uh, in chapter 3 of this epistle, uh, referring to Christ, and he says, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, the New Covenant, not of the letter, the Old Covenant, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. So again, there is that contrast between the covenants, the New Covenant versus the Old Covenant. The, the letter or the ministration of uh, death written and engraved in stone and that is contrasted with the, the Spirit, the Spirit that giveth life. And so he says, But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience. Well, uh, many, many verses we could tie in, but we'll, we'll just hit one or two as we go through these. Um, and the idea of patience. Paul said in Romans 5, verses 3 and 4, he says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. So, you know, when, when, again, from the human standpoint, why would anybody say we glory in tribulations? Well, he explains it. He says tribulation works patience, and patience experience and experience hope. So as we, and again, you know, we see the primary application there, but we can learn from this. And we learn that when we encounter things that give us trouble, when we are persecuted or whatever, when we endure those things, that, uh, that causes us to have more patience. It gives us experience in having patience through these tribulations. And so that's, that's how we can learn from these things and how we can apply these things in our own lives. And so he says, in much patience, in afflictions, and this this was always the passage that uh, just baffles me, is the, uh, all the things that Paul endured, and a lot of those will be mentioned here, and again in chapter uh, 11, I believe it is, or maybe 12 of this letter, where he has this laundry list of things that he has endured. All the things that he has endured, but he could still say, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And so again, th this is the beauty of Paul's attitude. He understood that tribulation worked patience, patience experience, and when he was afflicted, he considered that a light thing, uh, even when he would be beaten with whips, beaten with rods, stoned, as uh, he mentions in that list of things. Um, all these things that he endured, but he could still say and have such a positive attitude that he says, our light affliction, which is but for a moment. And so we have the contrast of life, human life, contrasted with eternity, uh, infinity. And, you know, life, you know, we, we look at somebody who lives maybe 100 or even lives over 100. Wow, they've had such a long life. And they have from the human standpoint. But that is nothing compared to eternity. <clears throat> and so Paul could look at that this way, that our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. We also read in Acts 20, verses 23 and 24, where the scripture says, Save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me or await me. Now, this is Paul speaking, and he realizes this. And he says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry so there again there's his primary focus his ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God and so again he would say here even in afflictions we give no offense and we are commending ourselves as the ministers of God and he says in necessities and we'll look at 
um, again in Acts 20, verse 34, where he said, Yea, yourselves know these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. Paul worked. He, he had an occupation. He was a tent maker. And when he had the opportunity, he would work. He'd done physical labor. He would make tents. And he would do that to provide for the necessities of himself and those that were with him. And even in that, see, he, he gave no offense that the ministry was not blamed. And, and as we read from the first epistle here, that he, he, uh, he didn't take anything from them, even though he was entitled to that. And he, did, he does that so that the ministry be not blamed. And again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he said, Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. So, again, as Paul would say here, in afflictions and in necessities, he done, he done those things and endured those things without murmuring. And he did those things to commend himself as a minister of God and those that were with him. And he says, and in distresses. And he would say in uh, chapter 4 of this epistle, verse 8, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. And so there were some similar things stated there. That's what he says here in our text that we're looking at today. And he, uh, he wrote to the Thessalonian brethren and told them, he says, We were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. So again, as Paul would endure all these things to commend themselves, himself and, them, and those with him as ministers of God and endure with much patience these things, this was such a comfort to him to see the faith, to, in other words, to see the result of his labor and to see people, in this instance, the Thessalonians, to see their faith. And their faith was, was known throughout the world and, and highly spoken of. And so this was a great comfort and encouragement to the Apostle Paul. And he goes on and says in verse 5, then, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, so again, and many more things here he mentions, and he says in stripes, and this is one of the things that he mentions in 2 Corinthians 11, where I mentioned the catalog, if you were, the list of things he mentions there. He says, uh, in verse 23, he says, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure. And in prisons more frequent. And he, he will say that, he says that in, the, in a, the verse here in our text, in straps, in imprisonments, and, um, and in 2 Corinthians there, he says, of the Jews five times received I 40 stripes, save one. So 39 stripes. And that was on five occasions. And I, I suspect that the time that I want to refer to here in Acts 16, that that's not included in that. Because uh, this was another occasion he was beaten of the Romans here in Acts 16, the account of the jailer. Um, and prior to that, what led up to that was him casting out the demon out of the little damsel that was following them around, crying out, these men are, are servants of the Most High God. And this troubled Paul after she did this many days and he cast out that evil spirit. Well, then her master saw that the hope of their games was gone. And so they caused a tumult, which... Again, this is in our very text here where Paul says in stripes and imprisonments and tumults, well, they caused a great tumult, a, a, a riot in the city. And Paul and Silas were captured there and they were beaten and thrust into the inner prison. As we read there in the account in Acts 16, uh, verses 23 and following. And again, so he says in imprisonments, verse 24 there of Acts 16, uh, the jailer, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And so you can go there and read uh, that account to refresh your memory there. 
and how that uh, the jailer uh, was uh, convicted by Paul's and Silas's uh, actions there. Again, the ministry was not blamed. Paul endured those things that the ministry be not blamed and to commend himself as ministers of God and look what happened. The jailer and his entire household was converted. They went the same hour of the night and was baptized immediately. And uh, so he says, uh, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults. And for instance, we can look at Acts 14, verse 19, where it says, And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. And so this, uh, I believe this was at Lystra, if memory serves. Um, and so they, they drug him out of the city. And uh, while the people stood around about him, Paul stood up and they went on their way. So he was blessed there uh, to not see death. Paul, uh, God was not done with him yet. Uh, he had much more to do. But here is one of the instances where uh, he was even stoned. And uh, we look at Acts 17 and verse 5. It says, But the Jews which believed not moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And so Acts 17 is a chapter that you can read, excuse me, to see how that the Jews were so actively persecuting the Christians, and they would even pursue the Apostle Paul. And... Uh, stir up the people and cause havoc and persecuting uh, the Christians uh, wherever they had the opportunity to do that. And this is how that old covenant Israel was filling up the measure of their sin by persecuting the Christians, killing the apostles, and uh, even early Christians there. So he says, uh, also he says in labors, and we look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, where Paul says, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And so Paul, uh, you know, we, we have, seems like the majority of the records that we have in the Bible are of Paul's, journeys. We don't have records of all these other apostles and if they made journeys to uh, various countries and so forth. And how interesting that would be if we did have records of that. But it, it's, it's like Paul had, uh, I don't want to say a guilty conscience because he always had a good conscience, but he still seems like there was something there in his mind because he had persecuted the church and God had mercy on him and he obeyed the gospel and it's like he dedicated himself to work harder than all the others and maybe that is wise because that he he failed to see uh, the truth for such a long time and he persecuted Christians and through the grace and mercy of God then he was permitted to be uh, put into the apostleship into the ministry but he says there that I labored more abundantly than they all. But even though that, it, it was through the grace of God. And uh, another passage, 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 9, he says there to the Thessalonians, For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. So here again, this is the same sentiment here as... Uh, what he expresses to the Corinthians. Um, he, he says, we had the right to be supported by you, but we didn't exercise that right. And he tells the Thessalonians the same thing here uh, that we just read from chapter 2 and verse 9. He says, uh, in watchings, and this would uh, kind of give us the idea of, uh, you know, staying up all night, uh, being watchful, um, for whatever reason. And in fastings, he says, 
Uh, for instance, we can see in uh, first, excuse me, in Acts 14 and verse 23, he says, And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. So this, uh, this practice of fasting is something that we don't hear much about. Um, you know, taught on in the in the churches today, but this was a regular um, routine, maybe for lack of a better word. This was something that they did, the Jews, that they did regularly. They fasted. And we, most people don't realize that fasting is even good on uh, on a bodily level it's good bodily it, it uh, strengthens our immune system and 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 various things that it even uh, improves our health um, not even considering the the religious aspect uh, if you know if a person wanted to fast and pray or whatever uh, there's that aspect but there's even also the aspect that it's it's good uh, health wise so again, this, this is something that we don't hear much taught on uh, in the churches today because, uh, well, I won't speculate on that. But anyway, uh, that's just something we don't study and we don't think much about. But this was something that was frequent and even uh, would perhaps be at times in Paul's because of all these things we're considering would even be involuntary. Um, just to get into a place where they didn't have food, uh, but they would have to have to fast. But anyway, we'll go on and look at verse six. And again, uh, he says, "Giving no offense to anything, that the minister be not blamed, commending ourselves as the ministers of God." He says here in verse six, "By pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned." So he says, "By pureness." And so we look at 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 10 where Paul says, You are witnesses of God also. How holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. So he is here to the Thessalonians. He says, you're, you're witnesses of this. You are God's witness of how we lived a holy life, a just life, and a life that was unblameable, our behavior, our manner of life among you, our conversation, a word we see in the King James Version a lot, you're witnesses of this. You saw this and you can testify to this fact. And so this is the pureness. And again, Paul is stating these things not to be boastful, but to commend themselves as ministers of God. He says, by knowledge. And this was something that Paul, he wanted everybody to understand, his knowledge. And we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, he says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we also look at Ephesians 3 and verse 4. This was the primary verse that I wanted to look at. It's where he says, uh, you know, I've taught you these things. And he says, uh, preach the gospel to you and writing these things down. And he says, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul was given this knowledge. Uh, supernaturally, miraculously, Jesus gave this directly to him as a direct revelation. We read that from Galatians chapter 1. But the point I want us to see is Paul wanted everybody else to understand his understanding of the knowledge of the mystery of Christ. And hopefully that uh, is easily understood, pun intended, uh, that Paul had this huge understanding of the knowledge of the mystery of Christ. He wanted to share that. He wanted other people to have that same level of understanding in the knowledge of the mystery of Christ. And, you know, we can learn from that and we can apply that uh, 
today, not that we have a, a miraculous measure of knowledge, but what I want us to see the same principle is that those of us who study and put in literally thousands of hours each year in studying and interpreting the scriptures as best we can, we too want other people to have that same level of understanding. And this is why that we dedicate ourselves and we put so much effort into writing and discussing, in debating, and in teaching these scriptures. And 9.9 .9 times out of 10, everything we teach is exactly what the text says. We don't have to try to manipulate the text to make it mean what it doesn't say already. So we, 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 see this, we see the same concept here. Paul, in order to commend himself as the minister of God, he wanted to make known this knowledge. He wanted other people to have the same level of understanding of this knowledge of the mystery, and the mystery was the revelation of the gospel, and that the Gentiles would be included in the salvation and brought into covenant relationship with God. He wanted everybody to understand that. And so uh, this was one of the things whereby he was commending himself as ministers, them as ministers of God, was through knowledge. And he says also here, by long suffering. And this is one thing that, uh, you know, we can all use more of. And I speak, I'll speak for myself. I could use more patience. I could always use more patience. I need more patience. Uh, there are things that are my pet peeves, if you will, uh, that really irk me, and I need more patience in those. And you know, we all, I guess we all have our individual weaknesses and things that perturb us in particular that, you know, whatever uh, would perturb you might not be such a bother to me, you know, and vice versa. But anyway, we all need more patience and long suffering. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, charity or love suffers long. It is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunteth not itself and is not puffed up. <coughs> and so this is the underlying principle of being long suffering, and that is love. Love is the foundation of long-suffering or patience um, and you know we need more of both so uh, we look also at Galatians 5 and verse 22 where we find here that long-suffering is one of the fruits of the Spirit Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is love joy peace long-suffering gentleness goodness faith and so again this is one of the fruits of the Spirit And we'll look at one more passage here from the idea of long-suffering. This is where Paul said, told Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. And that's where most people like to stop, right there. They like that idea of reprove, rebuke, and exhort. And they want to come down on people that they perceive are not living right, and are not perhaps um, learning and growing spiritually as quickly as they think they should. They want to come down on them. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. And they emphasize the reprove, rebuke, and exhort. But they overlook that next part with all long suffering. So the reproval and the rebuke and the exhortations is qualified. It is to be done with all long suffering and doctrine. So when we get the urge to reprove someone or to rebuke someone or even to exhort someone, it is to be according to what the scripture says and it is to be with long suffering. And Paul says, and by kindness. So we look at 
uh, let's see here, Romans 15, 19, he says, through mighty signs and wonders by the power. So that actually goes to the next uh, thought here by the Holy Ghost. So we'll, we'll kind of group together uh, the love, the long-suffering, and the kindness uh, in the same thought. So if one has love and they are long-suffering, then they're probably going to be kind. And even as we looked at what Paul told Timothy to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering, then that would suggest patience and also kindness that to be exhibited. And again, that is uh, to be done, as Paul says here in his instance, commending himself as ministers of God. And he says, by the Holy Ghost. And so then we look at Romans 15, 19, where he says, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Elycrium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. So this was done through the power of God, through the power, and we'll look at the power of God even in the next verse, but through, he says, by the Holy Ghost. And so God or Christ sent the Holy Spirit to be the comforter, to be with the apostles, to work through them and to enable them, to give them the ability to perform miracles, to confirm the word, Hebrews 2 and verse one, verses 1 through 4, and to have this supernatural ability, supernatural knowledge to... Uh, because they didn't have the words written down of the new covenant to where like we today where we can go and point at Acts 2.38 repent and be baptized for the mission of sin well they didn't have that so they had to have this knowledge miraculously and this was through the agency of the Holy Ghost and so Paul what Paul did this was through the power and the, the agency of the Holy Spirit and he said uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 4 he said my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. And so, again, the apostles had this miraculous power, supernatural power, that they could heal the sick, uh, even raise the dead. And they also had the ability to impart spiritual gifts to other Christians. And this was all through the agency of the Holy Spirit. And this was done to confirm the Word. Again, Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 4. And then he says, excuse me, by love unfeigned. And so we were talking about love being the foundation of patience or long-suffering. And so he says here, and by love unfeigned. Well, the word unfeigned means unpretentious. And we'll see the same word in Romans 12 and verse 9, and it's rendered there dissimulation. He says, let love be without dissimulation. So it's, in other words, it's not to be pretentious, pretentious. It's not to be a fake love. And that's what he's teaching here. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that was, which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Peter would write, Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another, how? With a pure heart, fervently. So again, the apostles teach that this godly love, this agape love, godly love is to be an unfeigned love. It's not to be this uh, facade or this shallow version of love that we have seen through the years that people love you and think you're, uh, you know, number one as long as you agree with them on every point in the Bible. And when there comes a disagreement on a particular point, well, then you are no longer loved. And you are cast aside like a dirty sock. That's a feigned love. That is a pretentious love. That's just a love that is by appearance only. And that is not a godly love. 
and that's what Paul is, is showing here, that in order to approve or commend ourselves as ministers of God, that the ministry be not blamed, this is to be done through an unpretentious love. So we go on then, verse 7, he says, by the word of truth. So it is not through fables of man, it's not through denominational creeds, it's not through the, the uh, doctrines and traditions and tr uh, things of man as in Paul's day. Uh, you know, and Jesus said, in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. They had their oral traditions, the Jews did, and many times they put more stock in those things than what the law actually said and in doing what, you know, doing the, the, the heart of the law. Um, and so, again, that's the same concept that we can see today where man has all these written bylaws and, and things and, and denominational creeds we don't put trust in those things. We don't put trust in the writings of scholars. And I'm not, I'm not trying to put down commentaries. They have their place, and we can learn a lot of things from them. But when it comes to the Word of God, then we can't take what a commentary says over what the Scripture says. And this is the Word of Truth. This is how we commend ourselves as ministers of God. Is As Paul says here, by exercising and preaching the word of truth. And he says in Ephesians 1 and verse 13, referring again to Christ, in whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, in, in during this transitionary time here between the covenants, then they had the miraculous operation of the Holy Spirit. And this is what he's referring to here when he says you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And they were sealed until the day of redemption, Ephesians 4. And I forgot the verse. But anyway, it's Ephesians 4. That he says that you were sealed un until the day of redemption. And so if we understand that now today that this miraculous operation of the Holy Spirit is no longer... Uh, operating, then we have to understand that the day of the Lord, it came. It's already come. And so that's another evidence that the Lord kept His promises. But anyway, He says, by the word of truth, by the power of God. Now we've considered the power of the Holy Ghost. Now He says the power of God. And, you know, this, this is kind of like separating between soul and spirit. Uh, you know, in Hebrews there we read about uh, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, it piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow and so forth. Uh, th there's such a fine line between soul and spirit. And it seems the same way here when we think about the power of the Holy Ghost and the power of God. There's such a fine line between the two uh, that it's, it's hard to actually make a clear distinction. But if we look at what Paul says in Ephesians 1, he says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the mighty, excuse me, to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. So perhaps we can look at that from this aspect. Uh, thinking of the power of God that this could be a reference to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God raised him from the dead. And then God and Christ sent the Holy Spirit, that we considered in the last verse, to be with the apostles to be the comforter. So he says then, by the word of truth, by the power of God, and I had made reference to Hebrews uh, chapter 2, verse 4 says, God also bearing the witness both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So again, this was uh, through the power of God and it was the mir miraculous operation of Holy Spirit. And then he says, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand 
and on the left. Well, obviously that brings to mind Paul's words in Ephesians chapter 6, where he said, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And he talks about there, uh, Take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, he says, and he says, having your, uh, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Well, he just said in our text, by the word of truth, by the power of God, and then by the armor of righteousness. And so Paul uses a parable, if you will. Here, a depiction of the the armor of the soldier, the, like a Roman soldier. And he would have on his battle armor, his battle gear, and he's ready for the battle. And so Paul uses that to illustrate that the Christian is to have on his armor of righteousness. It's not a spirit, it's not a physical carnal warfare it is a spiritual battle against uh, spiritual wickedness and, and so forth uh, that he mentions in other places. But he noticed that he says here, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. This is to be all around us. We are to be surrounded by this armor of righteousness. And he says, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true. And so here he's making contrasts, and he says, by honor and by dishonor. Well, you know, he would receive honor, and we'll look at an example here, and it's kind of a paradox, of when Peter and John, you know, we read there in Acts 3, they went up into the temple at the hour of prayer, and they healed the man there who was born lame. And he went with them into the temple, leaping and jumping and praising God. And the leaders there, you know, they said that, that a notable miracle has been done. We can't deny this, but we, we've got to stop this. <laughs> we've got to put a stop to this. And so they, they captured Peter and John and threatened them with a threat. And then they let them go. Well, Peter and John went right back to preaching and teaching in the temple. And so they captured them again. And they beat them. And so when we look at Acts 4, verse 21, where it says, When they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. Because all men glorified God for what had been done. So they couldn't deny the miracle. And so they couldn't punish them because of that. Well, then later, they captured, as I said, they captured them again. And the council goes aside, and they confer among themselves what to, what to do. And so it says in Acts 5, verse 40, uh, that they says to him they agree that's uh, Gamaliel if, if memory serves they told him they you need to watch what you're about to do uh, you know you may find yourself fight against God but anyway uh, it says to him they agreed and when they had called the apostles and beaten them they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and they let them go well that that would be a dishonorable not to mention uh, a physical painful thing but this was it would be humiliating to them to be beaten to be scourged but notice what it says and they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name so this is how paul could say by honor and by dishonor and then he says by evil report and by good report We read in Acts 24 and verse 5, and of course we don't have time to develop all the background of this, but again, we, we've looked at Acts 17 already of how the Jews would pursue Paul. And here's another instance where they were doing this, and it says, uh, We have found this man a pestilent fellow, a mover of sedition, among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. So they were bringing false accusations against Paul, and Paul would even stand up and defend himself, and he said, and tell the leaders there that they can't corroborate anything they're saying. 
but evil reports were were lodged against Paul and the apostles from time to time. And then, of course, that's contrasted with good reports of how that they would be commended uh, by other brethren, as we read from Thessalonians, how that they were witnesses of and could testify of Paul's manner of life and how that uh, they lived holy and unblameable and so forth. And he says, uh, as deceivers and yet true. So again, uh, depending on the allegations that would be laid against them, uh, they would be accused uh, of, of being deceivers, but they were not deceivers, they were true. And he would say in verse 9, as unknown and yet well known. Well, there were times where Paul would be unknown. And we have an instance of that in Acts 21 where another time where a big tumult was made and Paul was about to be pulled in pieces by the people and the captain of the, of the guard sent uh, some of his soldiers down to take Paul. And uh, they captured him and brought him up on the stairs and you know Paul wanted to speak uh, to the people there. And it says here, as Paul was led into the castle, he said to the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? And the man said, Who said, Can, Canst thou speak Greek? Art thou not that Egyptian, which before these days made an uproar and led out into the wilderness 4,000 men that were murderers? So th this was who this captain of the guard thought Paul was. So Paul was unknown at this particular point. But then there were times that he was well known as well. And uh, I know we're running out of time. And I wanted to get to uh, one more verse here. So he, he makes these contrasts as unknown yet well known as dying. And behold, we live as chastened and not killed. And he says, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing. As poor yet making many rich. And I wanted to get to that thought right there. Again, as poor. And again, we've seen things where Paul... Uh, all the distresses and things that he would would fall into, fall into shipwreck and various things, not have enough to eat at times, not have enough clothing at times. He was poor, but he was making many rich, not monetarily, but through the Spirit. And uh, let's see if I can find, I had a lot of verses here picked out that we just, we don't have time to go through all of these. Um, let's see in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9 Paul says for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich yet for your sakes he became poor that you through his poverty might be rich so here's the concept and we can see that also in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians uh, no excuse me I'm, I'm thinking of Philippians I believe chapter 2 but anyway, uh, Christ thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. See, he did this for man's sake. He, he had all the riches of heaven at his disposal. He left those things, and he took upon him the form of a servant, and that through his poverty, as we see here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul says uh, that you might be rich. And this is spiritual riches is what I'm getting at. And um, we see in James chapter 2 and verse 5 where James would say, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world? That would be monetarily. The poor of this world, rich in faith. That is the riches. Spiritual riches, rich in faith, he says, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. And so this is the kind of riches that Paul had in mind here, that he was poor, but through his work and commending himself as ministers of God, that he was making many rich because they could have this salvation that uh, was prophesied of that would come to all men, not just to one nation, but it would come to all men. And he says... Uh, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. So again, that's just saying the same thing in a different way. Uh, being poor yet making many rich, having nothing, uh, 
but yet possessing all things. And so we see this sentiment here as Paul is teaching here and doing all these things that the ministry be not blamed and to commend himself and those with him as the ministers of God. And he did this thing, he did these things and in preaching the gospel through hardships so that he could make others rich and as rich spiritually that they could be in the body of Christ and in the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that's where the true riches lie. And this is why it is so imperative that we be in the body of Christ, a member of his church, his kingdom, through faith and obedience, being baptized for remission of sins, being baptized into Christ, so that we can put on Christ and live with him forever. So we'll conclude our study here uh, in 2 Corinthians this morning, and Lord willing, pick up later uh, at our next scheduled assembly.